Are angels real? It's possible. Can they read our minds? I'm not convinced of Do that. Do people have guardian angels? That is a fascinating question. Dr. Michael Brown, an Old Testament scholar, who's going to help us make sense of the top questions people have about angels. They are hidden. Their role is not to be the ones who are seen. I was kind of shocked to see how much the Bible said about the spiritual realm. There's a lot more going on behind the scenes than we often see and realize. I'm not really concerned about proving that angels exist. What I want people to understand Dr. Brown, long overdue. Thanks so much for joining me on the show. Oh, my joy. Yeah, and absolutely overdue. Well, let's jump right in. I'm curious, what do you think is the best evidence that angels are real? Well, if, if we are Bible believers, if we're followers of hmm. Jesus and we take the testimony of Scripture seriously, then angels are absolutely real. Uh, hmm. When I did a study of this some decades ago, I was kind of shocked to see how much the Bible said about the spiritual realm. I mean, I knew it, but digging deep about angels and then demons and these other kinds of spiritual beings. So according to scripture, th there absolutely is a spiritual realm. In fact, Hebrews 12 tells us that, that believers are in the presence of God and among innumerable angels. And throughout mm. scripture, these angels carry out missions for God. They are divine messengers sent on missions. And, and then when you talk about divine intervention today, when you talk about things that seem inexplicable to us, how a certain thing happened, you could say, well, could it be that God was working through his angels? And just like in the physical realm, he works through us, right? He doesn't preach mm. the gospel from a megaphone in heaven. He uses us to share the gospel. He doesn't feed a poor person by just dropping bread on them. He uses us to bring it in the same way it seems in the spiritual realm that he has these messengers who go about doing his bidding. Hmm. This morning I was talking with my 10 year old. I said, hey, I'm interviewing a buddy of mine. Do you think there's good evidence for angels? And he goes, well, the Bible says it like, you know, in a 10 year old's mind, how hard is it? And yes. uh, of course, the evidence for the Bible is separate from this conversation. How much credence do you give to experiences and testimonies that people describe outside the Bible for encounters with angels? So if something is not contrary to Scripture, right, mm. it's, it's not something that's blatantly against what Scripture says, if it's generally in harmony with Scripture, or even more importantly, bring someone into a saving knowledge of Jesus, and, and this was an encounter that they had, I'm inclined to really look at that to say, could this hmm. be true? When I was in, in the faith as a new believer, came to faith in 1971 as a heroin shooting, LSD using 16-year-old mm -hmm. Jewish hippie rock drummer, <laughs> um, I was told by, by uh, my pastor that there had been one, one pastor, uh, an Italian brother that had come to faith and it riled some people in the mafia. It was an Italian church where I came to faith. and. Mm -hmm that they sent some hitmen to take him out. And he found out this story afterwards that this fellow said to him when he got saved, the hitman, he said, I was sent to get you. And I would have, except for those two huge guys that walked you out of the building every night. You were never alone. The guy was startled. He said, I was always alone. You know, wow. those kind of things are interesting. Or the many accounts of, of Muslims who have some mm. encounter, someone hands them a Bible and they turn around and the person's disappeared. Uh, I know one couple was sent from New York City. He was a PhD in English literature, a well-known Broadway actor. And he and his wife sent uh, to, to go minister in Israel and deal with drug addicts and different ones there. They have the same kind of encounter. Someone comes up to them in, a, in an obscure part of the city, shares a message. They turn around. The person disappeared, and there, there was nowhere to go. Mm. Those kinds of things get my attention. I don't base my faith on them, but they reinforce what I already believe. And I, ha I have no reason not to believe these things when the encounters glorify the Lord and they're in harmony with angelic scriptural activity. Mm. That's such a good answer. They're kind of corroborative support to the larger Christian biblical narrative that makes sense. So before we jump into some of the common questions that people have about angels, I'm curious why this issue matters, because some issues like the resurrection are obvious for facing suffering, the truth of Christianity, the release of the Holy Spirit, forgiveness of sins. But why does it matter that we think carefully and biblically about angels? Well, number one, it's in the Bible, and the Bible speaks about it a lot. So it makes us wonder, well, what's happening today? 
Are there, are there angels at work today? Hmm. A second thing is, it might be encouraging to believers to realize that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than we often see mm -hmm. and realize. You know, let, let, let's say that you're working on some mortgage deal and, and you're not hearing anything from the realtor or from the bank and you're really anxious because you got to sell your house and be out by a certain date. If you knew that people are really working behind the scenes, it, it gives you a more of a sense of, of ease. So there is this, this understanding that God's at work and, and he's, he's working through this massive army of unseen beings who are very, very real and, and very, very powerful. But the other reason I think that it's very important to understand this is because a lot of deception can come in this way. Hmm. Second Corinthians 11, 13 through 15 says that Satan comes as an angel of light. You have hmm. false religions and cults that have, there's a supernatural being that appeared and it brought some type of revelation or message. So we need to have discernment here as well. And therefore, we should understand that just as God is working in the angelic realm and the unseen realm, Satan is working in the unseen realm. We can get to the question of whether there's such a thing as fallen angels, etc. But it, a, a, if we have a right doctrinal understanding and we know what the role of angels would be and that they would always be exalting Jesus and exalting the word and never drawing attention to themselves, that'll help us avoid deception because you have some supernatural experience some invisible being appears and your whole room is shaking and that being gives a message you might be inclined to follow it if you didn't have discernment <laughs> yeah well well said you know that second point in particular years ago i had a debate with an atheist and was just prepping like crazy and my mom made that point that there are angels going before you and it just put my heart at ease. So mm. I love that point. Now let's start in Genesis as we get to the nature of angels and what they do. As you well know, being an Old Testament scholar, there's a lot of debate about the nature of angels. And Genesis 126 that says, let us make man in our image. Some would say that's a reference to the Trinity. Michael Heiser and even some Jewish scholars, as far as I'm aware, people like Dennis Prager have said, this is God proclaiming to the angels, let us make man in our image, which would apply that imply that angels are made in the image of God. Do you find that point compelling that angels are made in the image of God? Why or why not? I don't find it compelling. I find it interesting hmm. and possible. Uh, the Hebrew not say Adam, but Salmeinu kid mutenu is is what you read in English. Let, let us make man uh, in our likeness, ac according to our our, Im our image and, and our likeness. So, and, and selim is actually a word that can be used for an idol. In other words, it's an actual image of of mm. something. And demut is is a likeness. Uh, so, it's 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 very interesting. There are numerous arguments as to what it means. Some would say it's trinitarian. Uh, others would say. It's, it's what's called plural of majesty. It's deliberative speech. Let us mm -hmm. do this. But then why in our image and our likeness? There's some rabbinic commentaries that say that God is speaking to creation because he makes man out of the dust of the earth. Uh, but then is, is the dust of the earth in his image and his likeness? You could argue that because the Hebrew word Elohim, which means God or gods or divine beings, because it could on some occasions refer to angels, then that mm -hmm. would mean that of the spiritual realm, of the spiritual nature. And that's what it means in our image and likeness. It's possible, but it's not necessarily compelling to me because there seems to be something unique in human beings. In other words, angels, from what we understand, can't be redeemed. Uh, angels, mm. according to 1 Peter 1, long to look into the nature of the salvation that we have. Jesus takes on the form of human beings which, which is different and distinct in order to die for us. Now, these are not compelling arguments against this speaking about angels. And we know that angels have some involvement in divine activity, but were angels actually involved in the creation of human beings? Is there any hint of that? Uh, is it not elsewhere that we learn the father working through the son, everything mm -hmm. from the father through the son? So I'm not convinced of that. I'm not convinced that angels are fully in the image of God the way human beings are and experience things in the same way that human beings do. Now, we don't, we don't know other aspects of angelic activity or being or mm. consciousness. They're obviously not animals. They obviously have consciousness. They can communicate and understand, etc. But I'm not convinced 
that mm. angels are created in the image of God the same way human beings are. That's really helpful. So it's interesting to me that you said they're not fully made in the image of God. If we tie the image of God to certain capacities that we have, like in intelligence and rational thought or moral reasoning, then angels have those and hence would have at least a part of what it means to be made in the image of God. But there's also the angle that some would say, well, the image of God is just that we represent God over creation. It's the role that we play that is unique, that is the image of God. Do you lean towards one or the other, or is it some combination of our nature and the way we're made and the role that we play? Well, the role that we play is because of the nature that we have. There you uh, go. I don't believe created in his image and likeness though mm. refers to role, but to being in nature. Hence, mm. male and female, he creates us, and, and that's the fullness of the image of God expressed in male and female, and then our union together as one. So the role is secondary to our nature, as I understand mm. Scripture. That's great. That makes sense. I, I, I tend to agree. Well, let's jump into some of the particulars of angels. And this is where I think your research can be particularly helpful, because we'll start in the Old Testament. What are some of the different Hebrew words or terms that are translated as angel, or even if they're not the word angel, refer to angelic beings such as ministering spirits? And what does this tell us about them? Right, so uh, the primary word for angel is malach. Uh, it's interesting, we had the noun, but we didn't have a verb. In many, in many cases in Hebrew, uh, nouns come from verbs or vice versa, but they're clearly related. So the Hebrew word for rule is related to the Hebrew word for king, just like in English we would have to rule and a ruler. So we had this noun, but we didn't have the verb. And then when the Ugaritic tablets were, were established, so in, in northern Canaan, Syria, in the late 1920s, uh, it was discovered that there was a verb there, uh, probably hmm. la'aku, which means to, to send. So the mal'ach was one who was sent. Uh, so the mal'ach was a messenger. And, and that's why we understand that Hebrew mal'ach, just like Greek angelos, can mean angel or can mean messenger. Its fundamental meaning is a messenger, but in this case, a, a spiritual messenger, uh, a messenger made of a different substance. When Psalms mm -hmm. refer to the angels as, as ministering spirits, on the one hand, the Hebrew is talking about how God makes the, the wind uh, his, mm -hmm. his messenger, but then Hebrews uh, turns that kind of a, a midrashic Jewish homiletical way of reading it to say that that uh, these are ministering spirits so that they are like the Ruach, they are, they are uh, of the spirit. So we understand that just like human beings are of the flesh in terms of being earthly, I don't mean sinful nature, but earthly, right. we have these physical bodies, that they have spiritual bodies. Mm. Uh, but primarily the key thing we understand is they are divine messengers. They are sent mm. on missions from God. So they have particular tasks and assignments. And then when you begin to look and see uh, where angels are at work, they're intervening. Uh, they're coming mm -hmm. to someone with a message from God. They are fighting against an enemy of God. They are protecting the people of God. So they are, in short, carrying out the will of God on the earth, but in the invisible realm. And then every mm -hmm. so often, when it's appropriate, appearing in the physical realm. That's super helpful. Now let's let's break down this in terms of a category that Michael Heiser uses in his book Angels. And I understand you'll probably have some differences theologically with him, which is totally fine, but this format and this approach is helpful. He says there's the question of nature, status, and function. And in some ways you've weighed into this, but when we talk about the nature of angels, they appear as men at times. Interestingly enough, never women, as far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong, they appear as men, which means they're physical, but they're also spirits. So what are angels in terms of their nature? Right. So what we have to understand is the spiritual realm is not emptiness. It's not void. It's not air. Uh, it is actual being, but of a different substance. So, for example, the resurrected bodies that we'll receive, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. Mm. So when we talk about, for example, Judaism emphasizes that God is incorporeal. 
that he doesn't have mm -hmm. a body. Well, it also says in Numbers 12 that Moses saw the tunah, the form of the Lord, right? So it, it, it could well be that God has a, an actual form. It is just not like the wind or some magic carpet floating through the air. Sure. So as surely as we have physical forms and physical bodies, angels have spirit forms and spirit bodies. So it is a different substance, which in our realm is unseen but in the spiritual realm has power over mm. over this natural realm so we, we need to think of of actual beings and just look at it like this when they cross over into our world we can actually see them uh, mm. when they cross over into our world we can see how glorious and powerful they are i mean you you have accounts in scripture be it daniel uh be it john in the book of revelation seeing an angel they're they're overwhelmed or or the natural impulse is to fall down and worship, or people think in the mm. Old Testament they're going to die because they realize that the man that they were talking to was actually the angel of the Lord, and therefore, in some way, bearing the the presence mm. of God, bearing the the nature or reality of God, because they were of that realm, and it's that powerful and that intense. Mm. So we do have reason to believe that angels could be still appearing as men physically and operating. Maybe we recognize them sometimes. It's this overwhelming, powerful response you explained. But also Hebrews 13, we could be entertaining angels and be unaware, so they could appear physically. But angels also could be present and acting in ways we cannot physically see them. Do they operate potentially in both ways today? Uh, yes, certainly there's no reason to say that they don't appear. There's nothing in the Bible that says it only happened in biblical days, right? And Hebrews 13 encourages us to entertain strangers, saying that sometimes mm. people have entertained angels unawares. So there's every reason scripturally, both logically and the text saying it itself, that angels could appear today and that we might even not, uh, we might not realize it was an angel until later on, you know, someone uh, picks up a hitchhiker and this hitchhiker shares words with them that are mm. life transforming and says, I got to get out now. And it's kind of the middle of nowhere and drop the person off. And next thing, there, there's nobody there, no sign of anyone, nowhere they could go. Those things can happen. But mm. based on scripture, the vast majority, the 99.999% of angelic activity is hidden, is unseen, mm. is not something visible to the natural eye. The, the occurrences are the exception to the rule and not the thing that we ever look for or long for or anything like that to, to try to see into the spiritual realm in that way can open us up to deception. However, or, or to imagine that everything is an angel. Well, you know, that at the grocery store, the, the, the checkout clerk was so nice. It must have been an angel. You know, we could exaggerate in those ways. But for sure based on the testimony of scripture, there's angelic activity mm. happening as you and I are talking in, in the worlds around us. That's great. Now, one more question on nature before we move to status. Uh, angels always appear, as far as I'm aware, as men. So given that they're spirits but appear as men, do we have reason to believe that angels are sexed or because their nature is as a spirit being, uh, we shouldn't read into it and think that they're sexed beings? No, I don't think we should look at them as sexed beings. Uh, mm. We know that Matthew 18, Jesus tells us that angels don't marry. They're not given in, mm. in marriage. Uh, look, in, in the same way, we don't look at God himself as a sexed being. He clearly transcends gender, even though he is revealed with, with masculine pronouns and spoken of in masculine ways. We look at him as transcending gender, as, as God the Spirit. So yes, you have names like Michael. Angels are referred to as as he when they're referred to, you know, the captain of the Lord's hosts in Joshua the fifth chapter, etc. And then even in extra biblical literature, you know, you have names like Raphael and Samael and Mitatron, and they're generally speaking all male. Uh, but no, I don't think we should read into that that they are sexed beings for whatever mm. reason they're identified as male. And they're clearly not female, but mm. I don't think we should read much more into it. And especially if you only have male beings, then in what sense are they sex? There's no procreation. There's no one to procreate mm. with. Uh, so I, I think the category of biological sex doesn't apply in their realm. 
That's great. So we're using Heiser's three-part uh, kind of metric. We looked at the nature of angels. His second point was the status. What's the status of angels compared to human beings? And is there a hierarchy such as archangels? There seems clearly to be a hierarchy. Uh, the Bible does speak about archangels. It does mention certain ones as like a, a chief prince or having a certain function like, like Michael in Daniel, the 10th chapter, uh, also mentioned as, as archangel. We know that Gabriel is sent for unique mm. messages. You know, he's the one that comes to, to Zechariah, the father of John, the baptizer. He's mm. the one that comes to Miriam, Mary, the, the father of, of, of the mother of Jesus. So he's, he clearly has certain status in terms of his role. Um, and then when you read in Ephesians 6 about the spiritual warfare that we engage in and Satan's hordes, uh, whether it's angelic, demonic, both, etc., it's clearly organized. There's a clear hierarchy, hmm. and, and there's an army order to it. And you would just think if, if God is revealed as Adonai Tzvaot, the Lord of hosts, meaning the Lord of the armies of heaven, that there is order, that there is function, hmm. uh, that there is a, a hierarchy in that regard as well. So we, we don't have a lot of details in Scripture, but God's nature, the way he orders things in this world, the few references we have to angels of higher status, the ordering of the demonic realm would indicate to us that absolutely there is an angelic hierarchy. That's really helpful and a great way to look at it from God's creation, from human beings, from the hint at order and God's character that we would expect such a thing, even if we don't have it fleshed out in the way we might desire. Last one, again, Heiser's uh, approach of nature. We looked at spirit beings that are not sex, that can take on physical form. Status, there is a hierarchy amongst angels. The last one Heiser says is function. What do angels primarily do? Right, so they are working with God to carry out his will uh, on the earth and in the invisible realm. So as such... They were involved, for example, in the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Uh, Paul references that. Stephen references that. So uh, as God gave the law and spoke, somehow angels were involved in that. Could it be in the physical manifestations, the sound, the different things going on? Either way, they were involved with that. At critical times, coming with messages to people, uh, an angel coming and, and revealing something. Uh, an angel coming to Ezekiel and revealing things to him about the future at the end of his book, or coming to Daniel in the ninth chapter. Okay, here's a message. So they're helping carry out the will of God on the earth. They are coming with messages. Uh, they are fighting against our enemies. You have the mm. angel of the Lord that kills 185,000 Assyrians who are about to destroy Jerusalem mm. and, and, and re wreak havoc on the Jewish people. So uh, angelic uh, intervention in that regard, angelic uh, oversight in our lives, the protection, uh, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. So everything that God has promised us uh, in terms of protection, in terms of going with us, in terms of fighting against our enemies, in, in terms of carrying out his will on the earth, it seems that angels behind the scenes are involved in all those different ways. Now, again, mm. all glory always goes to God. So there's no glory that comes to angels. Hence, most of what happens mm. we are unaware of. And if we were mm. aware of it, we might give glory in the wrong way. Mm. Yeah, I, I remember, Sean, I, I had been with a, a young man decades ago. I was probably in my late 20s at this point, And he claimed to have all this insight into the spiritual realm I remember thinking, boy, I just don't see in the spiritual realm. I, I know the Lord. I'm intimate with God, my relationship with him, but I don't see in the spiritual realm. And I, I was mm. up late one night praying and, and just kind of wanting to have more vision and insight. If I could just see what was happening more with light and darkness behind the, behind the scenes, it would you know, help me minister more effectively. And our younger daughter, who was really, really, you know, she's a skinny little kid, 
she she had come downstairs. She woke up in the middle of the night and came downstairs. And I was on my face praying. And I looked up and I saw she had her nightgown on. I just saw her little ankle and foot. And I was like, mm. oh! I was almost completely petrified. <laughs> then I I thought, okay, it's, it's probably good. I don't see more in the spiritual. World. But but the point the point of the matter is that these beings are unseen for a reason. Human beings mm. being who they are. We, we would be much more prone to worship them. Uh, and I believe that even in the will of God, they are hidden uh, so, so that there is not a distraction. And their role mm -hmm. is not to be the ones who are seen, but the ones who are bringing glory to God by carrying out his mission with us. All right. So let me play a skeptic. Some atheists are going to say, OK, Michael, that's really convenient. Right when we want the evidence, they're hidden because that's their task feels like you're making this up to avoid the fact that there's not really the evidence of the supernatural and angels. What would you say? I'm not really concerned about proving that angels exist. It's immaterial mm. to me. Uh, what I want people to understand is the reality of God. Mm. So th there's an old story. There's this, this old woman, uh, and she's destitute, Christian woman. She's got no food in her house whatsoever. And she prays a prayer. Uh, and she says, Lord, you know I've got no food, I've got no money, I'm absolutely destitute. I'm going to take a walk in, uh, into the woods here. When I come back to my house, I believe that you're going to bring all the groceries I need. And there's a little boy, a little prankster in the neighborhood, happened to hear her praying because the window was open. So he decides, I'm really going to mess with this lady. He runs into town, buys all these groceries, climbs into the window, puts them inside. And he's thinking, when, when she comes back, she's going to think that God did it. So she walks in and sure enough, all the groceries on the table and she falls to her knees. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for sending the food. And the boy yells it through the window. Hey, lady, God didn't send it. I brought it. He goes, she goes, I don't care if the devil brought it. God sent it. <laughs> so in all seriousness, right? That's awesome. If, if let's just say there's a terrorist attack, right? And, mm. and we are about to be taken out and little children are going to be killed by these terrorists and and suddenly all of them simultaneously 20 of them fall down and die of heart attacks at that very split second i don't i don't need to know did angels do it how did it i just know that god intervened and that there's no hmm. possible way that suddenly at that moment that happened or six different bolts of lightning come down hmm. from six different points of heaven and strike them all dead I don't need to know if an angel brought it or not. All mm. I need to know is we cry out and God delivered in a way that there's no natural explanation mm. for. Uh, I was recently listening to Craig Keener's shorter book on miracles today, not his two volume study. Yeah. He gets into a lot of philosophy as well, but very separate book, Miracles Today. Mm -hmm. It's so overwhelming with testimonies. Mm. It's so completely overwhelming with documented, miraculous testimonies for which there is no logical explanation and which happen in direct response to prayer in undeniable mm. ways. The book's amazing. It almost becomes redundant because there is so much documented evidence. So to me, it, it takes, just like it takes a tremendous amount of faith to deny God's work, say in DNA and the programming of a, of a human body. It takes a tremendous mm. amount of, of faith, really shutting off your mind to reality mm. to deny all the miraculous testimony. So whether it came via angel or not is very secondary to me. The key mm -hmm. thing is there's evidence, overwhelming evidence for the activity of God in the invisible realm manifest in the natural realm. That's great. So this third piece we're looking at is the function of angels. And you described it as their messengers that do tasks, delivering the law or uh, going out and delivering a message, for example. What about seraphim and cherubim? Growing up, I always assumed that they were angels, and yet they don't seem to go out. They seem to proclaim the Lord and maybe have some kind of protective role. Not that God needs it, but they're just stationed there. Should we look at them as angels, angel-type beings, or something totally different? Well, we don't, we don't have data about other beings, mm. right? So if they are other beings, what are they? Uh, I've always understood them to be angelic beings, uh, so the, the seraphim you have in, in Isaiah 6, is mm -hmm. it related to the root seraph, which would be burning, so they would be flaming beings of, of some kind. Uh, mm. We know that some created beings seem to exist to worship and glorify God. 
And it seems to be uh, just like the elders in heaven in Revelation 4, this overwhelmingly glorious experience where every time you look and glimpse at him, you're just stunned and overwhelmed and, and worship. Uh, so whether it is symbolic protection, the, the Kruvim, the cherubim in Genesis 3 uh, are clearly have an angelic role there of protecting the Garden mm-hmm. of Eden from, mm-hmm. from human, uh, human entry. Uh, the seraphim in Isaiah 6 are before the throne of God worshiping. It, it adds to the sense of holiness and his overwhelming nature. Uh, so we don't understand all of this. You know, the cherubim that are pictured with the Ark of the Covenant, obviously having some role then in the, the giving of the law or the maintenance of the law. But we just get a glimpse at their glory, their power, their majesty as part of a glimpse of the greatness and the glory of God. Mm. If this is part of his created host, uh, how great is this God who creates mm. them? Uh, that being said, the Bible doesn't give us more data, and therefore we can't know more. Uh, you know, often whole books are written on speculative verses or uh, uh, an abstract interpretation of a word, and people base their whole ministries on it. There's really nothing to it. Hmm. So we just don't know more. I remember reading a commentary uh, it's on the book of Revelation where God says to John, the angel says, don't write, don't write an explanation for this. And the commentary says, well, it says don't write, but we can speculate as to what would have been written. (laughs) I wonder, do we really need to? I really appreciate that, that you're with Scripture, drawing rational inferences, but admitting when there's not the data and not drawing too much. Well, let's use that. Excuse me. Let's use that careful thinking and jump into some of the most common questions people ask. You hinted at this earlier, but can fallen angels be redeemed? Can they experience salvation? No. Best Mm -hmm. as I understand scripture, no. That's the difference between human beings and angels. Uh, So the angels that fell are referenced elsewhere. They're referenced in Jude. They're referenced in 2 Peter. They're referenced in extra-biblical literature. And they are confined. They they are uh, in a hellish-type prison. Uh, Their fate has been sealed. When Jesus rose from the dead, he descended into the netherworld and declared his victory, 1 Peter 3. He preached to the spirits in prison that long Mm -hmm. ago had disobeyed in Noah's day. It doesn't mean he preached the gospel. It's a different Greek word there. Rather, he made proclamation, I am he, it is finished, it is done. And that's why it seems that angels long to look into our redemption because Mm. it's something they never experienced. And Mm. perhaps being in the direct presence of God, not being in in a faith realm as we are, they made their choices and those choices are sealed and fixed, just like there's no hint that there's possible redemption for for Satan uh, either. So I see no no data at all that angels mm. can be redeemed. And how would they be redeemed outside of the blood of Jesus? And yet mm. there there was no blood shed for them. The blood was shed for the human race. Mm. All right, great answer. Are angels eternal? It seems so, but by the will of God. In other mm. words. God alone possesses immortality, 1 Timothy 6. Only God by his nature is eternal. And even human beings, even if we argue that the human soul is eternal, the Mm. immortality of the soul, let's say that's our position. Matthew 10, 28 says God can destroy both body and soul in Mm. hell. So will the fallen angels be tormented forever and ever and ever? based on, say, Revelation 14 and Revelation 20, uh, perhaps. But God Mm. could destroy them if that was his will. So they do Mm. not inherently possess uh, eternal life. If they have eternal life, it is by the will of God, by the gift Mm. of God, and he could ultimately destroy them. So only God innately is an eternal being. Mm. All other beings, because they are created, can be Mm. destroyed if God so desires. That's a really helpful way to look at it, that if they are eternal, it's derived eternality into the future, but certainly not into the past because they're created beings and dependent upon God for their existence. Uh, uh, only God is the Alpha and the Omega, mm-hmm. the first and last. Only God it can be said of God, Adalam, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That can only mm-hmm. be said of God himself. Amen. So do angels know everything? And if not, what do they know? And where are maybe some of their limitations? 
So again, we only know what's written in Scripture, mm. but only God is represented as all-knowing. Only mm. God is represented as omnipresent. So angels are not almighty beings. And it, it would seem, if we want to derive something from Job, the first chapter, where Satan appears among the angels of God, and, and I believe it is actually the devil, Satan. Dr. Heiser and I would have had a difference over that in my Job commentary I get into, was, was Hasatan mm. the same as the devil? Uh, mm. But I, I do believe you can make the best case for that, as most Christians would naturally read it. Mm. But it seems they're going out getting information and coming back and reporting to God. So the only one who's omnipotent and then who interacts with them based mm. on information would be God, whereas the angels have specific missions. And within those missions, it seems they have certain information. Uh, we know that the angels don't know the time of the return of the Lord. Jesus in his earthly ministry, that was, with, that was something that he willingly put away, uh, his, his omniscience, right, and, and functioned as a human being. So uh, you know, put away temporarily that divine prerogative. So the angels certainly don't know everything. Mm. And you could imagine they know what they need to know to function mm. and complete their missions. So angels are not eternal. They're created. Angels don't know everything. Do we have reason to believe that they are more powerful and know more than human beings? Or are we at the point where we're starting to speculate? No, for sure they're more powerful. Just the one reference I had of the angel of the Lord destroying 185,000 Assyrians, it doesn't, it doesn't speak of angels plural <laughs> or the, the heavenly host mm. doing it, but one angelic being doing it. Uh, pictures of angels in the book of Revelation, I understand it's symbolic, but these angels having, having mighty power, the fact that angels could protect us, the fact that, for example, in, in 2 Kings 6, when, uh, when Elisha uh, looks up and sees uh, the armies of heaven, in, in, like flaming fire mm. surrounding the city, and he says they're more of us than of them, right? and, and therefore you're protect, completely protected. So certainly they have tremendous power. Mm. That's the first thing. Uh, second thing is that they certainly know things we don't know because they are from generation to generation to generation to generation, right? They, they've been mm. here uh, through the millennia mm. and they can see in the spiritual realm uh, things that we can't see. We're much more limited. Think of what we knew in terms of general information that was accessible before the internet, as opposed to now. Think of how quickly we, mm. we learn about news today uh, on our cell phones compared to getting a newspaper 50 years ago. So mm. you think the realm in which angels live, there's access mm. to a whole lot of things that we don't have access to. So certainly they know more than us, certainly they're more powerful than us. But again, there's God and then there's angels and, and the difference between them is infinite. You've referenced this a couple of times, so I'd love to know, especially as an Old Testament scholar, your take on this, the identity of the angel of the Lord. You said it's not angels of the Lord, but angel of the Lord. Do you think this is the pre-incarnate Christ? For sure, there are passages where Malach Adonai, the angel of the Lord, is the pre-incarnate son of God. That mm. seems absolutely clear to me from a number mm. of passages. For example, Exodus, the third chapter where mm. the Malach, the angel, appears in the burning bush, begins to speak to, to Moses on God's behalf, but then very clearly, God is in that angelic being uh, to the point that he says, I, I am that I am. That's when he reveals his name uh, to Moses and his being to Moses. It seems clear there. Uh, you can make cases for other angelic activity in the, in the Hebrew Bible where it is the angel of the Lord being the son himself, or even mm. the captain of the Lord's hosts in mm. Joshua, the fifth chapter, mm. is that the Lord himself? So you, you can definitely argue for that. The question is, every time it says the angel of the Lord, does that mean that it is this distinct pre-incarnate messenger? So in, in Hebrew, when you have a proper name following a word, right? So the servant of Sean, uh, mm -hmm. I don't have to. I I don't have to say the servant of the 
Sean because mm. Sean is a proper name. So it's going to make that that uh, ob- noun before that you definite. So the angel of the Lord, once you put of the Lord afterwards, it's going to say the angel. So it doesn't mean that distinct one. Or if you had many servants, each one would mm. be the servant of Sean. So that's why it's debatable. The Hebrew construction could indicate a unique angel each time, or simply speaking of one particular angel of the Lord. So was it the pre-incarnate sun that strikes down the Assyrians? It could be, but Mm. there's no reason to think that uh, specifically, unless it's a role of deliverance, because there's nothing revelatory about the sun or revelatory about God in that. But when the Malach comes and reveals something about God in the first person, you know, in in, in Genesis 22, There are even some rabbinic commentaries Mm. who point out the interesting language where the angel of the Lord says to Abraham, because Abraham, because you didn't withhold your only son from me. Mm. You'd say, well, it's God speaking through the angel. True, true. But it is interesting Mm. language there that that angel seems to be bearing the very presence of God. So not all the cases, but certainly some of the cases where you see, quote, the angel of the Lord. It's definitely speaking about the pre-incarnate son. How would Jews and Jewish scholars tend to make sense of these passages? Because in light of Christ, it seems so clear to me that this is the pre-incarnate Christ speaking, and they're just giving us a flavor of when this God comes down in human flesh. How would Jewish scholars who are not uh, Messianic explain or make sense of some of those passages? Right, so they would, they would attribute it to angelology, they would say mm. that just as a prophet could say, I, the Lord, say to you, that the okay. angel could say, I, the Lord, say to you, that they are messages bearing the, the presence of God. Mm. Uh, even in Genesis 18, which to me is the clearest passage in the Hebrew Bible mm. about uh, God coming in incarnate form, where it says that Yahweh appeared to, to Abraham and Sarah. And then it says he looks up and sees three men. And then he has an extended conversation with one of the men. Sarah has a conversation who is identified explicitly as Yahweh. Mm. And then at the end of the chapter, uh, Abraham has an extended back and forth with Yahweh, uh, pleading for the sparing of of Sodom. And then when they're done, it says Yahweh left, right? I mean, it's just as if they were talking, and then he gets up and walks away. And then Genesis 19, 1 begins with, and the two angels came to Sodom. It's like, okay, there's Yahweh and two Mm. angels. But rabbinic Judaism says, well, it was actually three angels appearing and Michael and Raphael being two of them and each had a specific mission and role. It it just is is forced. To to be honest, when you go through Mm. Genesis 18 uh, and you read it through, uh, it's it's very forced to me, Genesis 18 into the 19th chapter, to try to make it into three angels. It's Mm. clearly Yahweh with two angels appearing. The church fathers even thought it was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because you have oh, three. Oh, interesting. Okay. But as best as we understand, the Father is hidden. No one has ever seen the Father. It's the Son mm. who makes him known. So do angels have free will? Can they still rebel against God today and possibly even in the future? That is a fascinating question. <laughs> My opinion is no. Hmm. That in hmm. other words, choices were made. Uh, and, and once those choices were made, the rebels were either punished or in Satan's service or, or some, some in both cases, uh, and the rest go on serving God, and th- everything is fixed. Now, I can't prove it, but there's mm. nothing in Scripture that points to an angelic rebellion in the mm. future beyond what happened. Uh, mm. It seems that there is Satan and if we understand Satan and, and the fallen angels, right? If that's what Revelation 12 is talking about, that one third of the angels fell in a rebellion. Um, there doesn't seem to be any indica- ind- indication that these other angels could potentially fall. And think mm. of it like this. We know that as believers in the eternal realm, there will right. be no possibility of sin. One, there'll be no devil, there'll be no sin, there'll be no yep. flesh, there'll be no world. Two, there'll be no sinful nature in us. And three, we will already have made our choice to say we want to serve the Lord forever, and now Mm. he's going to keep us. So it's not against our will. It's forever and ever. We Mm. we get to serve him and honor him and love him. 
uh, s- s- like a husband making vows to a wife or a wife to husband at marriage, you mean it forever, right? Now you're going to be in a realm where there's no possibility of it not happening. Mm. So it could be that there was a choice, a point where angels could choose, right? And then choices were made and now it's fixed. So I, mm. I can't argue that for sure, but that seems to be the scriptural logic. Love it. What about the idea of guardian angels? There's a couple of passages, Matthew 18, Acts 12, that hint at this idea in different ways, like angels protecting children. Uh, when Peter comes to the door, they say, ah, it's his angel. Seems to me at most, this would say that children maybe have guardian angels and maybe Peter, an apostle did. What's your take on that? Do believers have guardian angels? Right. So when, when they thought it was his angel or spirit, I mean, they, did, they didn't quite know what to make of it. And it was, it was a panicked note because mm. it sounds like Peter, but it's obviously not Peter. Uh, so does the angel sound like the person or was that just a superstition? So I wouldn't want to draw too much from that. Mm. Matthew 18 clearly does speak of angels watching over little ones. And if those little ones are hurt or abused, that, that they have the eye of the father. I mean, it's a pretty mm. devastating passage. Now, does that mm. mean that each individual child has an angel? Or does it mean that they are just overall, they have these missions and they're watching, they're watching over, right? Can they watch over 10 at a time or 100 or 1,000 or is it one-on-one? Mm. On the other hand, Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Uh, so there are God fearers. There are hundreds of millions of believers who would be known as those who fear and love the Lord. So you could make an argument from that, that each one of us has an angel uh, looking out for us. Hmm. Uh, because what happens at any given moment, we could come under some attack where we need deliverance, or there could be some need for angelic intervention. So is it, okay, you, you go here, you go, you got like the master programmer, like, all right, we dispatching angels, or... Uh, is there an angel with each of us? It's nice to think of each of us having a guardian angel, but honestly, in my own mind, it doesn't affect anything mm. because I know the presence of God and the love of God and the goodness of God and the mm. promises of God. So how he carries those things out, I have, that's his business. You know, 2 Corinthians 13, 14 speaks of the communion of the spirit. Mm. So I enjoy fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And, and I know that God is my father and Jesus is my Lord and my friend. That's, that's my consciousness. What angels are doing in the invisible realm is not what I'm focused on mm. or conscious of. So I, I think you can make an argument for angels watching over each of God's people. I just don't know that we can be dogmatic about it. Mm. And either way, what I need to know is that God's eye is on my life. If I know that, I'm good. Well said. What do you make of the the claim that angels can read minds? Because Heiser says it's possible, but he's not convinced, although angels seem to shape the way people think. So he said maybe it's like a CD or a DVD where you write information into it from afar. Uh, what's your thought on the idea that angels could actually read our minds? Yeah, the question is often asked about Satan, right, which might even be more yeah. relevant. Can mm. Satan read our minds? Mm. And I always assumed, well, of course he can, because sometimes you have these intense mental battles and where it seems that there's a, a temptation mm. or a pull or something from the outside, and, and then you're responding internally, right? You're, you're not speaking out loud. Like, can you rebuke the devil in your mind without speaking out loud? I would say, of course you can, mm. right? James, the fourth chapter, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he'll flee. You don't have to outwardly say, Satan, I resist you. You could simply resist him in your mind, and, and he would know that. But what's interesting is that people that have seemed to have bona fide ministries where people were really delivered from demons in demonstrable ways, they pretty much universally teach that Satan can't read your mind, hmm. which I found very interesting. The best explanation I heard is that they can say things. So now we'll apply this to angels they have enough insight to see how we respond that just hmm. like a, a trained psychologist who's counseled thousands of people, you come in with your absolutely unique problems that are totally unique to you alone. 
and they know you like they've talked to you a thousand times before. Why? Because things fall into categories and they understand that. So it could be that looking from the spiritual realm, so mm. much more is obvious uh, that without actually reading our minds, that they can intuit information. Mm. On the other hand, I don't see anything in the scripture that says they can't read our minds. Mm. So I, I, I'm agnostic on this only because I don't see anything explicit scripturally. But I think we should act as if they can read our minds. Oh, meaning, interesting. Meaning mm. that silent prayers that are prayed or, or needs that are, that are expressed don't always have to be expressed out loud. You know, I'm charismatic. I pray in tongues. One mm. of my friends says, well, if we pray in tongues, Satan can't understand this, so I'm going to pray in tongues more. I don't, I don't care what Satan understands or doesn't understand. <laughs> That's not my issue. My issue is that God hears my prayer, right? That's my issue. Um, but that being said, uh, if it's comforting to think that as you're praying and expressing a, a desperate need to God and, and you're doing it silently and an angel may be needed in that, if it's comforting to think that, the angel is, is there to help based on that, or that God's going to relay the information instantly to the angel. Either way, uh, the last thing I want to do is get into a debate about this. Fair enough. And I know you like good debates, so point taken. Uh, you mentioned speaking in tongues. First Corinthians 13, it talks about the tongue, tongues of angels. And it says, though I speak with the tongues of angels. This is Paul, of course. Some argue that it's an ancient Hebrew or like proto-Hebrew dialect. Some say it's an esoteric language or something else. Do you have a take on that? I see no reason to think that it's proto-Hebrew or, or a, a proto-Semitic type of language or anything like that. Nothing, nothing at all would suggest that to me. Even if you argue that the, the Genesis account, the account of creation presupposes a language similar to Hebrew is the first language that was spoken. So the Adam is taken out of the Adama, for example, uh, and, and that would presuppose Hebrew or, mm. or a Semitic language. Uh, there's no evidence that that's what the angels spoke uh, as their mm. language. So to, to make it Hebrew or Greek or some other known language, no, I, I don't see that. In fact, I see the contrast between tongues of angels and, and tongues of men. So to me, it's either... Uh, there are three possibilities. One, hmm. that there is an angelic language okay. that we don't know. Two, that it's just a poetic way of speaking of, of the most heavenly language imaginable. Or three, that when we do pray in tongues, pray in the spirit, that that is the language of angels. And that's hmm. what Paul's saying, because he says in 1 Corinthians 14, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. He doesn't say, I thank God I speak in more foreign languages but actually speak hmm. in tongues in, in this spiritual language more than any of you. So could that be the language of angels? It's possible. But again, that's the one reference, so hmm. we don't want to draw too much out of it. Do you think angels keep records of what humans do? There's a suggestion in Isaiah 65 and Daniel 7 that they do so. Amongst the tasks, because sometimes we see this portrayed in like popular cartoons or movies that angels are writing down, keeping a record. Is there reason to believe that that's one of the tasks they might do? Yes, absolutely. Because we mm -hmm. know there are records kept. We know that books are opened. We know, again, that God works mm -hmm. through his messengers. We know, for example, in Ezekiel 9, that the, the angels are told to go put a mark on the heads of those who grieve and mourn over the destruction of Jerusalem and, and the destroying angels are to pass by when they do that. You know, so here they are marking people. You know, Malachi 3 mentions a, a book of remembrance, those who fear the Lord, who, who keeps the books, right? So I think we could say for sure that part of what they do is record keeping. I love it. So three last questions about angels for you. Uh, do angels have wings? It seems so. Maybe not all of them, but at least hmm. some of them. You know, angels do come flying. And again, we know the seraphim have six wings in, in Isaiah 6, and the cherubim are described with wings. Hmm. Uh, so in, in the making of the, some of the items for the, the, uh, in the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat with the, with the cherubim, etc. So maybe not all have wings, but absolutely some do. Mm -hmm. Can believers command angels? 
Yeah, so that would be based on, on Hebrews 1.14, that they are, are sent to, to do our bidding. It's possible that we can. Mm. I don't see anyone in Scripture doing it. Uh, it's, it's a charismatic teaching I've heard over the years, you know, that I command my angels to do X, Y, Z. Mm. I just don't see anything in the Bible that tells us to do that. What we do is we pray to God. We can take authority over demonic spirits in Jesus' name, but others we pray to God for God to act. So in my mind, let God dispatch the angels. I'm going to pray to him, let mm. God dispatch the angels. It seems that they are here uh, to, do our, our, to, do, to do what's necessary for our salvation as opposed to, to go about doing our bidding. So I'm, I'm not going to say that someone is absolutely wrong if they say they commanded an angel. I just don't see it as the scriptural pattern, and it's, it's nothing that I've ever done, and nor have I seemed to have a, a, a lack in my life because I haven't mm. done it. Do believers become angels when they die? No, absolutely not. Hmm. We get resurrected bodies, and we are glorified human beings forever and ever, and absolutely in a completely distinct, separate class. We do not become angels in any way, shape, size, or form. Love it. Now, did I miss anything in terms of questions you get asked? These are all the questions I get asked, I think about. Did I miss anything about angels that you're like, oh, Sean, I was hoping you asked me this, or here's a point that's vital, or did we cover it? No, I think we covered it. You know, the, the, hmm. the key thing to me is about angelic activity today and what to expect. And, hmm. and always, everything needs to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and everything needs to be sifted by the authority of scripture. So on the one hand, there are people who are so open to the spiritual realm. I'm talking about angels and angelic activity day and night. You think it's surprising you just don't float away, you know, at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes what I hear is very, very flaky. <laughs> on the other hand, there are some who are just so absolutely cynical. You know, mm. J.P. Moreland, one of the great Christian philosophers yeah. of the day, has some amazing documented stories about angels. You it know, does. how do you explain when different people unrelated see the exact same thing and draw pictures of it to describe the angels mm -hmm. who are with him? And th that would indicate the guardian angel thing of, of angels being with us. So I think we have to avoid the extremes of gullibility on the one hand and cynicism on the other hand. And when we hear something that glorifies Jesus, that leads to to the Lord being known in a solid biblical way, to a disciple being made, to an answer to prayer that honors the Lord, and there's apparent angelic activity in the, in the midst of it, that should just encourage us mm. rather than, on the one hand, send us into uh, exalting angels, or on the other hand, send us into a spiritual witch hunt to deny that it ever happened. Mm. I love that you refer to J.P. Moreland, who you know is a colleague and a friend of mine at Biola. I was with him at an event. We were on stage answering questions. Lady came up to us afterwards, and she said distinctly over you, J.P., and she describes this angelic being that she saw, like, protecting him. And at first when I'm hearing this, I got to admit, I'm like, okay, here we go. Here's a crazy story. And J.P.'s like, I have had multiple people mm. tell me the same thing. In different settings and i sat there and was like whoa am i being the skeptical one here and jpi trusts as much as anybody and the details matched up was like wow there is something supernatural going on here so i love that you referred to that that power taking place today to my viewers i just want to point out a few things first off dr brown you're an amazing guest we got through all of these questions and i want people to see how pointed your answers were always went back to scripture and the strength of your answers was based upon how clear Scripture is. That is such a good principle that I want to live by and follow, and I hope my viewers will follow that as well. Also, know how much you were citing Scripture all over the place. Obviously, not to show off and sound smart, but because you've studied it, and you've thought about it, and you've really put time into this really a model of how to think about these things, which I super value. Now, I love this book by Heiser. There's some issues I differ with and I know you do as well, but his book on uh, angels is a good one that I would recommend. Are there any other books or is your teaching on angels and demons available that people could watch who want to go further? Yeah, so uh, some years ago, I, I interviewed Pastor Jack Graham, who wrote a book on angels. Mm. 
and it really inspired me. Uh, so that book, uh, I, and, and the interview, it was really stirring. It was faith building, in fact. So hmm. as much as I'm familiar with what the Bible says, it really stirred me. There's so much in there, and it was encouraging in terms of the love of God and the goodness of God and the care of God. And Jack is writing this as a, as a Southern Baptist. So mm. that's a good book. Uh, then my teaching, it's actually audio teaching. I did it some decades ago. I did, okay. I did a whole series on spiritual warfare, uh, eight 90-minute sessions, and then a whole series on angels, wow. demons, and deliverance, just really trying to get into what the Word said. And after I taught the series... A few times, we, we just used one. It used to be on, on cassette tapes, if you remember that, many, many years ago. I do. Kid. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I thought, you know, that's the best I taught it. So we just used that mm. all these years later. So on our website, askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org, if people click in store and then audio classes, it's really inexpensive to download. But it's 12 hours on spiritual warfare, wow. deeply in the word and then 12 hours on angels, demons, and deliverance, where I, I tried to go through every single reference. And that's what surprised me, just there's so much in the Bible about this. We mm -hmm. would expect to see some relevance in our own day today, for sure. And, and Sean, it's been very rare in my own mm -hmm. life that people have sent me words about angelic protection or something, but it, it came at a key time when it was very, very meaningful and felt real to me. And I think the takeaway from, uh, for us is, is just like you know, hey, your, your best friend who's a real intercessor is praying for you on a trip, and that gives you some comfort or encouragement. Or mm -hmm. like somebody, an athlete, and they got their family there rooting for them, and that gives them some encouragement that, hey, you're there with me. Or, you know, you're in the hospital sick, but you know that you got your loved ones standing on the bed with you. You know, these, just these mm -hmm. natural things psychologically, emotionally can help us. Well, how much more this reality of these tremendously powerful supernatural beings mm. sent by a God who's jealous for our well-being uh, to be with us and to help us carry out our mission on earth. That's, a, that's an edifying thought. That's mm. an encouraging thought. That's amazing. I'm going to check out that uh, the, the audio tapes myself and the teachings. I've done a lot of interviews with ex-New Agers, ex-witches, ex-psychics. Mm. And questions of deliverance have come up, and I've wanted to do a show just really walking through biblical discernment because there's even debate among people that I was not really aware of in this world and would just love your take on it. So we'll do that down the road. Those of you watching going, man, this was awesome, and you stayed with us. We will have Dr. Brown back, but also make sure you subscribe to his podcast, his YouTube channel, just doing daily commentary that's biblical, super helpful. Really appreciate your voice. Can't thank you enough for coming on. But before we click away, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other interviews coming up on all sorts of apologetics, theological, cultural topics you won't want to miss. And if you thought about studying apologetics, we have the top-rated apologetics program here at Biola. Fully online and distance have students around the world. And these kind of questions, spiritual warfare and theology, is a piece of the master's degree that you get we also have a certificate program below where if you're not ready for a master's, we walk people through this kind of training, and there's a significant discount below, so make sure you check it out. Dr. Brown, thanks for your time. This is really, really fun. We'll do it again soon. My joy, and you're doing a terrific job online. Your, your YouTube mm. videos are excellent. Thanks, brother.